This is CSAP Science and Policy Podcast, where we're bringing you the latest evidence and expertise to improve public policymaking. This week, we're proud to present the 14th episode in our series on science, policy, and pandemics. This episode is brought to you in partnership with Cambridge Infectious Diseases and the Cambridge Immunology Network. In this episode, our host, Dr. Rob Doubleday, is joined by Dr. Este Torek, Dr. Caroline Trotter, and Dr. Flavio Toxfer. Welcome to CSAP's Science Policy Podcast. This week, we're talking about vaccines and immunology. In this episode, we'll discuss our current understanding of immunology and the vaccines under development, challenges involved in vaccine distribution, insights we've gained about innovation and knowledge exchange through this vaccine development process. Joining us for this discussion, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Esti Torok, clinical academic at the University of Cambridge and Adam Brooks Hospital. Infectious diseases expert, Dr. Caroline Trotter, who's academic director of the Cambridge Africa programme. And Dr. Flavio Toxford, who's an economist, also at the University of Cambridge, working on the economics of epidemiology. Este, would you mind getting us going by giving an update on our current understanding of the immunology and telling us a bit about what vaccines are currently under development? So, I mean, you're obviously all aware that SARS-CoV emerged in in China in December 2019 and has spread worldwide. Um, In terms of the immune response to uh, coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2, there have been some studies that have characterised the immune response um, and have shown that the T-cell responses, which is a type of uh, white cell against the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, correlates well with antibody responses in COVID patients. And this has implications for the design of vaccines against this virus. Over the past uh, few months, obviously, the virus appeared in December. It was sequenced in January of this year. And a number of groups around the world have been developing vaccines against the virus. And at the moment, there are 13 in clinical trials. And Esther, you you say that there's a correlation between observations of T cells present and antibodies present. I mean, what does that mean? So, so basically, most people who uh, are infected with the virus develop an antibody response uh, between 10 and 21 days after infection. Um, this can take a bit longer, up to four weeks or more, um, in patients who have mild disease. So, there have been a number of studies that have looked at sort of antibody levels um, and also people who've looked at um, T cell responses in similar patients. And what you see is over two to four weeks, um, you get both cellular and humoral, so T cell and B cell responses to the virus. Um, and the generation of antibody. What we don't know at the moment is whether those antibodies are neutralizing, you know, whether they can sort of completely get rid of the virus, and indeed how long the level of protection lasts for. And so there are ongoing studies around the world looking at this. And and so when should we expect to get a clearer answer to both those clearly very important questions? Within a few months, I I expect. I think the United Kingdom is hoping to test 100,000 people uh, to look at um, antibody responses um, in the UK in people who have and haven't been infected. Um, And then within the context of vaccine studies, there are obviously much more detailed immunological tests going on. Is there a way to find out if immunity to COVID-19 is permanent or or if not, how long it lasts? You need, I guess, zero epidemiological surveys that probably go on over over years. So in terms of sort of seasonal coronaviruses, we know from, from those studies that immunity to those lasts for about two to three years. What vaccine candidates are currently under investigation? So at the moment, there are a number of vaccine candidates um, that that are being developed. I've been involved in in the Oxford vaccine, which is a novel coronavirus vaccine uh, that involves uh, an adenovirus vector that comes from a chimp. So it is non-infectious to humans and doesn't replicate in humans. And that has been sort of partnered um, with the spike protein, which is the part of the virus that generates immune responses to, to produce a genetically modified organism vaccine. And that's injected into humans, results in the expression of the spike protein to which people hopefully develop immune responses. Um, And there have been data both in mouse models and in macaque models, so a monkey model that shows that uh, you get antibody responses and T-cell responses to this vaccine. Um, And in the animal model, it has also been shown to be protective against severe disease, but doesn't prevent infection. 
There are other types of vaccines being developed that are whole cell inactivated vaccines. There are some concerns about those because of the risk of if the inactivation process isn't perfect, the virus may obviously become activated again and may cause actual disease. So there are sort of various different approaches that are being used by different um, universities and companies around the world. So what work have you been doing as part of the Oxford vaccine trials? We were contacted at the beginning of May of this year and asked if we wanted to take part in in, in the uh, COV-02 study, which is a phase 2-3 study of the, the Oxford vaccine. And the aim of this study was to recruit 10,260 people across a number of centres in the UK. And so we spent the first four weeks or so trying to get the study protocol approved um, in Cambridge and also assembling a team of, of people um, and one of the things about the COVID epidemic is that people, some people have been redeployed into clinical um, practice uh, and a lot of research nurses and research facilities were therefore shut down. But that meant that there were people available across a number of different sites and organisations who were able to come together very quickly. And we were able to assemble a team of over 70 people who were willing to work on the, on the COVID vaccine trial. So once we um, had permission to proceed, which we got on the 28th of May, so what is that, 25 days after we were initially approached, we then started advertising on the 29th of May. Um, and then between the 1st and the 10th of June, we screened over 500 participants. And between the 10th and the 20th of June, we've vaccinated over 300 participants. So it's been an amazing uh, experience because we've uh, managed to do all that in the space of six weeks. And this is a process that normally takes months or years <laughs> to achieve. Um, and the other thing that's been absolutely amazing is that AstraZeneca have committed to scale up production of the vaccine while the trial is going on so that if it is found to be efficacious and safe, it can be rolled out um, to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. So, it, you know, it's been an, a complete shift in the paradigm of kind of vaccine development and deployment. What has struck you most in the past few weeks? I think what has struck me is that what you can get done in an incredibly short period of time, in, in that, you know, if somebody had said to me that you, uh, we would be able to get this set up and delivered within a, a six-week period, that would have been unthinkable a year ago. I mean, should, should I, as a, as a citizen, be worried that you've cut any corners? You know, the research <laughs> governance has been done in super quick time. Everything, you know, the study protocols and all the documents have obviously gone through a research ethics service, um, the Human Research Authority and NHRA, because it's a GMO vaccine trial. So it's had scrutiny at kind of national level. Um, and then we've obviously had scrutiny at local level. The thing that's been most challenging, really, is the number of changes that have happened during the course of the study and the fact that we've had to adapt to them. So you'd often get an email at 10 o'clock at night about something that had changed that you'd have to implement in terms of training your staff for the following morning. And, you know, under normal circumstances, nobody would be willing to do that in the context of a coronavirus pandemic and a, and a, and a vaccine trial. People were very willing to just sort of come on board and do whatever was necessary. When can we expect to have some sense of whether the Oxford vaccine will work? Well, officially, the trial runs for a year. So, so officially, we'll know the answer in a year. But in fact, the Data and Safety Monitoring Board are looking at the data every couple of weeks. We're sort of updated with, with information unofficially. I think if, if there's a clear signal by autumn of this year or Christmas of this year, um, then there will be a, a sort of a no-go, a no-go decision made in terms of rolling it out outside the, the trial setting. Um, so that's what we've sort of heard unofficially from Oxford, but, uh, but obviously the official line is that the trial will run until June next year. Flavio. Yeah. So could I ask you, Esti, um, many times, uh, you know, drug developers, they, they do a cost benefit analysis in terms of uh, or rather than a net present value calculation to decide whether to proceed with a specific candidate, um, because these are very expensive things. Uh, is it your impression that we have gone down the ranking of less and less likely candidates uh, because of the urgency of the situation that we want to basically have a, as broad a portfolio of possible vaccines uh, and therefore we are putting money into ones that are maybe less likely and that under normal circumstances wouldn't have been funded? It's really difficult to know. I mean, the fact that there are 13 uh, candidates in clinical trials, and I think about another 129 in preclinical studies, suggests that people are kind of hedging their bets a bit. But I guess if you have an infrastructure that can scale up production, then whichever vaccine turns out to be the right vaccine or the best vaccine, you can hopefully 
flex to be able to produce that one more quickly as well. In terms of the health economics analysis of it, you know, I'm not the best person to comment on that, but I but I imagine that people will be looking at that side of things as well. On the uh, sort of minus side, the impact that COVID has had on economies, wor- you know, worldwide has been massive, and so there is a, a huge imperative to to develop and roll out a vaccine as quickly as possible because of the impact that it's having. And also another thing is to make it accessible. Countries, um, you know, w- which are suffering, you know, really large epidemics and and um, who may not be able to afford vaccines. So there are initiatives, I think, to address that as well. Caroline, now how do you think the international community has adapted and responded to what we've learned so far about vaccines over the last few years? The landscape shifted really post Ebola. So there were massive efforts to develop an Ebola vaccine and trial an Ebola vaccine because of the West African epidemic. There was a whole new uh, blueprint developed by the World Health Organization for doing these trials in very difficult epidemic situations. Um, the uh, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, CEPI, yeah. was formed, which really you know, shifts, shifts this landscape to you know, thinking about epidemic preparedness for, for different vaccines. Yeah, I think really it, it helps to galvanise people to think about, well, what's coming next? How can we prepare for what's coming next? And uh, I don't think this particular virus was, was on the list, but I mean, certainly coronavirus, MERS coronavirus would be on the list of, of diseases that CEPI were trying to prepare against. But I think it re- it does really help to uh, think about how can we develop things more quickly, um, and then working with organisations like uh, Gavi, that the Vaccine Alliance, um, who are already thinking about well, if we have a vaccine, how might we deliver this to uh, low and middle income countries as well? I think that this is, it's fantastic to have have these organisations um, preparing and, and and ready for these challenges. You know, obviously, we are waiting, uh, you know, for the trials to be conducted, and we kind of expect that trials might not give clear answers. Like, yes, this vaccine will will completely knock the virus out, but we may get answers that, well, the vaccine doesn't completely knock the virus out, but it it may help in terms of reduce the severity of the disease. In t- in policy terms, how do we think about different? kind of different roles that vaccines can play? Yeah, I mean, I think um, Nesta emphasised when she was talking that the endpoints of this trial are are safety and efficacy. We're not going to roll out millions of doses of a vaccine if there's any uh, potential issues with with safety. And um, we need to know it works to some extent. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be 100% effective. Um, People are looking at um, malaria vaccines, which probably only provide about 30% infection currently. So so in this situation, um, it may be a, a matter that a less effective vaccine could still be have a big overall population impact. I think we need, to, you know, it, from a policy policy perspective, we need to know a little bit more about the properties of the vaccine. Does it work just in healthy adults? Does it could it work in those who are at risk, the older adults um, with comorbidities? Um, many vaccines are actually less effective in in, in those risk groups. And um, does it work in children? Um, so flu vaccines are, are given to children to, to sort of prevent the com- onward community transmission. That that may not apply here, but we need to know which groups it works in. Um, I would also need to be aware of the current epidemic situation. So um, what phase in the epidemic uh, would the UK be when it's looked, when the vaccines are ready? You might, how many vac- doses are going to be available? So if there's limited supply initially, you might want to concentrate on, on groups who are still at high risk. So um, people are working in hospitals and, and care homes and perhaps add teachers to that list. So I think it's, it's a matter of assessing both the properties of the vaccine and the current situation in the epidemic. What do we need to think about regarding how vaccines are distributed internationally? Yeah, again, I think this is where organisations uh, like CEPI and Gavi can, can really help to, to the thinking along this. I mean, I, I think AstraZeneca are preparing to, to produce uh, hundreds of millions of doses mm-hmm. and, and will licence uh, this vaccine if it works to... Um, other manufacturers, including the Serum Institute of India, who have massive capacity and, and produce large quantities of vaccines uh, for different antigens for, for low and uh, middle income countries. Um, yeah, I wonder if Flavia, I could bring you in on, on that. What's your perspective uh, for, from an economist's point of view about, you know, what's the, what's the best way to, to distribute or, or think about procuring vaccines once we know whether or not they work or the extent to which they work? Well, so one of one of the fears that 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 uh, kind of that have been voiced, and I think is is realistic, is that there's going to be some amount of competition between countries in order to get their hands on these uh, on these very valuable vaccines. So, for example, in 2009, I think one of the first companies that came out with a vaccine against swine flu was based in Australia, and I think they were actually restricted 
to sell to other countries only once they had met domestic demand. And also in more recent times, there have been some cases that suggest that there's some kind of jockeying for position to get hold of, of vaccines early. Uh, there, there are reports that a, a, a promising German a vaccine developer was approached by the Trump administration to see whether they could move their production to the U.S., uh, which suggests that, you know, at least as an incentive to do this. And I think, uh, as Caroline rightly pointed out, the fact that m much of this uh, work is carried out in alliances is probably some safeguard against that kind of behavior. Uh, and I think it's interesting to note that AstraZeneca who is one of the uh, partners in, um, in CEPI, also is uh, involved in the European Inclusive Vaccines Alliance uh, with another you know, group of countries. So I think that's, uh, that's very important. I think uh, it's important for, for countries, for example, like, like the UK, to, to think carefully about this in terms of, of course, both helping themselves, but also help others, because at some point we might be on the receiving end of, uh, or rather on the other side of the, of the, of the bargain, and so I think it's important to, to realize that this is an ongoing relationship. And so reciprocity is not just uh, morally correct, it is also a sensible policy. Uh, what do we need to think about regarding how vaccines are distributed in the United Kingdom? I think it's unavoidable in the short run that there's going to be some kind of rationing. It's just unlikely we're going to be able to, treat, to, to vaccinate everyone in the population at the same time. And I think there's some very interesting and tricky conversations to be had about how we actually do this. How do we roll it out? I think there is consensus that probably frontline uh, NHS staff should probably be amongst the first because it's kind of a, the infrastructure we all depend on. Uh, but then there's a very interesting choice to be made about whether we give it to people who are most at risk, who are, the, say, the people who are currently shielding, or whether we want to give it to um, to you know young people to to get the economy starting again. And so. In some sense, this debate is, is, is not very unlike the one we've had, but in another context. Do we, do we isolate everyone so nobody you know, transfers the disease, or do we just isolate the ones that are most at risk and then let, kind of let the disease rip in the rest of the population? This is a, a trade-off that, uh, that is not straightforward, and I think it's, it's worth thinking about as a society. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I, I mean, society needs to make these choices. Um, I mean, I, I'm... I'm confident that there's good decision-making infrastructure around vaccines uh, in, the, in the UK and actually globally led by the World Health Organization. And there's been a lot of work over the past uh, decade or more to strengthen um, national sort of NITAGs, national immunization technical advisory groups. Um, so there's, there's a lot of expertise that, that exists um, and uh, people used to making these trade-offs and fairly difficult choices. Caroline, how do you think the current pandemic will impact on anti-vaccine movements? Will, will attitudes to vaccines be, be a big issue? So one of the one of the um, slides I showed, I was giving a lecture to the students about vaccines. I, I, I picked up a meme that said, um, uh, "This is this is a world without one vaccine. Uh, imagine imagine the world without any." Um, so I'm hopeful that if if there's a, a safe and efficacious uh, COVID-19 vaccine, um, that it will help to promote uh, vaccines in, in general. Um, you know, we're on the verge of, of polio eradication. Um, there, are, there, are, there are many excellent vaccines um, that we can improve access to. I think, I think the UK position is maybe slightly different to other European countries. I think the issues with falling vaccine coverage are probably around, um, not anti-vax arguments, but around uh, people being able to access um, services, sort of service delivery. Um, but, you know, globally, it's certainly an issue. And I'm, I'm, let's be optimistic again and hope that um, this will help to promote uh, the use of vaccines around the world. Flavio, can I ask you, I mean, you've been doing work at the moment to try and sort of bring insights, also cross-fertilise insights from the economic modelling world and, and the infectious diseases world. What, what do you see as as what's working well and, and what's not working well when it comes to this, this kind of exchange of ideas between these two academic communities? There, there's been a, uh, an explosion in research within the economics community because we now found ourselves in, in a crisis which, which, which reaches very deep into a territory which is traditionally purely economic activity. The, the, unfortunately, because what we have at our disposal now is, is so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions, these are exactly the same activities that we need in order for the economy to work. So interaction, consumption, going to work, and so on. And so 
um, there, there's been a strong interest in trying to understand how to best manage uh, these kind of uh, situations and also getting up to speed and learning a lot about you know, infectious diseases, which traditionally has been a kind of a sideshow within uh, the economics discipline. So I, I think it's very interesting note, to note that there's recently been a strong uh, cross-fertilization, or maybe that's maybe putting it too strongly. I think economists are more interested in, in epidemiology than and vice versa. But uh, I think it's, it's some very, very interesting and important work is, is coming out of, of my research community right now, not just myself, of course, but many people who are working in this field. And I, I hope that going forward, this is something that's going to benefit also the, uh, the modeling community that comes from the other side. Because, of course, when governments are having to make decisions, they're being informed by you know, what expertise they're getting from the infectious diseases and epidemiology world on one side the kind of economic analysis of the impact of various options on the other side. How well have you seen these two kind of sets of, of expert inputs integrated? So let me give you an example where, where for example, thinking like an economist would, would inform uh, at this, a policy decision about whether to take up a specific vaccine. So, for example, if, if there's a new drug uh, on the market and the, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence has to decide whether this uh, has a, a good uh, you know, cost-benefit ratio, typically what they do is they say, well, well, what's the cost of the drug? And then we are trying to figure out what is the benefit to a given individual patient uh, of administering this particular drug. Now, it turns out that much the same thinking is also used uh, when evaluating the, the value of vaccines. Now, it turns out that when you have infectious diseases, there's a direct benefit to the individual who's being immunized. But there's a secondary effect, which, which is really what, in, what interests economists and what interests public health officials, which is that by infecting one person or rather one person becoming infected, you also infect other people. And that means there's a secondary uh, value of vaccination, which is a social value, which is an externality effect. So we know, for example, in a, in, from, from other, from other uh, domains, that when there are externalities, then individuals do not necessarily... Uh, take these into account in their in their personal decision making, and and this is just uh, very. I mean, so for so so just to to make it very clear, uh, in in a world where there are externalities, these should be calculated into the value of the of the vaccine, and that means that vaccines are, are multiples maybe more more valuable uh, than they would have been if you just take the perspective of single individual patient. John Caroline, you've worked on vaccines for different diseases in different contexts. Do you think that we are collectively learning more now about vaccines that in, in ways that could be useful in other contexts? Or, or is each case sort of so so different from another that we have to sort of relearn these things each time? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a matter that we have to relearn things each time. I think you know the, the, agi- the agility and the, and the speed is is really important. And you know, the, the alliances that I've already mentioned, I'm really optimistic that this will help to make sure that um, people around the globe that need vaccines, who need vaccines, uh, are able to get them. Um, I mean, drawing on, on Flavio's point about bringing in the economics, I mean, in, in, in some of the research I'm doing with looking at the full value proposition of, of new vaccines. So it's thinking not just about the narrow health impact, but can vaccines actually... Um, improve educational attainment and economic attainment. So what's the broader value of vaccines? And I think this is all moving in, you know, in, in a good direction. So one of the things I, I found particularly interesting is the, you can think of it as the industrial organization of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so one of the, of the predictions of, of, of industrial economics is that in, in a situation where demand for a product increases, that would intensify competition. It seems to me that in the current situation, we've seen several signs of actually of increased cooperation between companies rather than competition. So there are some companies that have actually uh, pledged that they were going to provide a vaccine if it's developed at, at cost, which is extraordinary and, and quite unlike the pharmaceutical industry, um, because it seems on, you know, at face value to be a lost profit uh, uh, opportunity. Um, now, of course, one can always argue that they're going to bank on the goodwill going forward, but but still, nevertheless, uh, interesting that they would probably be pricing this well below what, what is the actual value of the vaccines. Uh, another instance of this kind of cooperation is, uh, for example, a company like Pfizer has put their infrastructure at disposal of other companies if they have good candidates um, to, to do so. And I also think there's a general understanding in the industry that even if, say, the Oxford uh, group 
were to be the first to develop the vaccine, they will probably not be able to produce all the vaccines necessary just within AstraZeneca. They would have to use the productive capacity of other companies. And so even though there might be a race to be the first to develop the, the first vaccine, I think there's an understanding that there's going to be a second st ter ter stage where there's going to be some element of cooperation. Yeah, I I'm, I'm wondering whether the Manhattan Project is the right parallel here. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, that, that, that is interesting in, in terms of, you know, historians of science have looked in the past at particularly sort of productive places of scientific research. And one common feature has been a sense of sort of purpose, a sense of common purpose. And, and that, you know, the Manhattan Project is given as one example, but, you know, other places that are very, very different in almost every other way from the Manhattan Project. But if they have a sense of collective purpose, you know, the, the, they have been shown to be quite productive. Well, I think uh, I think on that, I'll say huge thanks to you all for, for taking part. Thank you very much. CSAP Science and Policy Podcast is a production of the Center for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. This episode of our series on science, policy, and pandemics has been produced in partnership with Cambridge Infectious Diseases and the Cambridge Immunology Network. This episode was hosted by Dr. Rob Doubleday and was produced by me, Kate McNeil. Our guests this week were Dr. Este Torek, Dr. Caroline Trotter, and Dr. Flavio Toxfer. You can learn more about CSAP's work by visiting us on Twitter at CSIPOL or by visiting our website at www.csap.cam.ac.uk. If you have feedback about this episode or questions you'd like us to address in a future week, please email inquiries at csap.cam.ac.uk. Thanks for listening.